In episode 88 of this podcast, we spoke to the good people at Think Orbital to find out all about the future of commercial space station. Well, today we catch up with them as they've got some big news about a brand new partnership with NASA. What are your thoughts on the future of space flight? Let us know via our social media pages at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram, Threads, and Facebook, or via the contact form on our website. And please consider joining us over at patreon.com forward slash space and things. But right now, enjoy episode 154 of the Space and Things Podcast. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles. And welcome to episode 154 of the Space and Things podcast. Emily, I'm going to assume you're all right uh, and just get straight on to to this week's main feature. I'm doing great. Let's go get on. Let's get on to the great. main feature because we <laughs> it's a great interview and you guys are going to love it. Absolutely. So back in May 2022, we spoke to Sebastian Esprella, the CEO of Think Orbital. We also spoke to their VP of Technical Development, Jim McConnell, to find out about their plans for commercial space stations. And we've been keeping an eye on what they've been up to ever since. In June of this year, NASA announced that it will partner with seven U.S. companies to meet future commercial and government needs. And Think Orbital is one of the seven companies named, along with SpaceX, Blue Origin, Northrop Grumman, Sierra Space Corporation, Special Aerospace Services, and Vast Space. These partnerships aren't grants, but instead they offer these commercial companies access to NASA's expertise, assessment, and technology. We'd like to learn more about what this means and what Think Orbital are planning on working on with NASA. So today we're talking again to Sebastian. And this time, we're also talking to the company president, Lee Rosen. He's a former VP at SpaceX and commander of the USAF's 45th launch group at Cape Canaveral. Grab your flight controls and hang on. Here comes the Space and Things podcast with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. Welcome back, Sebastian, and welcome, Lee. It's great to have a chance to talk about Think Orbital again, but before we get up to date with all things Think Orbital... While our listeners may remember Sebastian, if not, go and listen to episode 88 again, they've not yet met you, Lee. So please introduce yourself and how did you end up as president of Think Orbital? Yeah, thanks again for having us. Uh, Really excited to be here and appreciate your time today. Uh, Yeah, so I am the co-founder and uh, president and chief strategy officer here at Think Orbital. And I served for 23 years in the United States Air Force as a engineer, space operator, and space acquisition officer. I had the opportunity to do several assignments uh, at the National Reconnaissance Office, buying and flying spy satellites at the Space Systems Center in Los Angeles, working on uh, rockets and on uh, various satellite systems, and uh, had the opportunity uh, of a lifetime to command at both launch bases, both at Vandenberg Air Force Base and my final act in the Air Force, which uh, is now, I guess, the Space Force, part of the Air Force. Uh, I was the launch group commander at Cape Canaveral in the 45th launch group. So, Amazing. you know, it was a big year. We launched like 10 different rockets at that time. So, uh, <laughs> you know, things have changed since uh, the, yeah. the good old days there. But uh, <laughs> very interesting uh, opportunity when I was commander, General Bob Kaler, who was the head of Space Command at the time, uh, called down and uh, President Obama was going to come down and announce this commercial space initiative where commercial companies are going to launch things to the International Space Station. It can never be done, my gosh. Uh, but he made this bold move and uh, came to Cape Canaveral. And uh, General Kaler asked me to to show the president around. And we were talking about what you know where we should go and what we should do. And I said, oh, yeah, let's go over to see Atlas V new pad. It was brand new and beautiful. And he's like, no, 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 let's go see those new guys uh, at SpaceX. And I'm like, oh boy, sir, you know, if we kill the president and they blow some shit up, uh, (laughs) you know, that would be career limiting for both of us. So let's not do that. And he's like, no, 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 it'll be fine. So uh, in the intervening time waiting for President Obama to show up, it was pretty much just me and Elon in the hangar. And this is before Elon was Elon, right? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, In the hangar, just talking about things like, you know, what do you do with the rocket after you launch it? Well, it becomes a reef for the fishes. Well, do you know of any mode of transportation that you throw away after one usage? 
Oh, uh, no, can't think of one. Well, that's stupid. Why do you do it? Uh, and then we talked about, you know, landing rockets. And I said, well, how about a parachute? And he said, parachutes don't work on Mars. And I'm like, hmm, something's going on in this guy's head that's very different from everyone else's head. This was kind of the, the opportunity uh, that I saw to really change the way the industry was going. And the trend that had been happening at the time was warfighters were getting less capability on orbit because launch costs kept going up. Russia and China had, or Russia and the French had pretty much captured the commercial market at the time. It was not looking good for the U.S. launch market, frankly. I saw an opportunity and uh, decided to retire from the Air Force and had the opportunity to go to SpaceX. Went through a full interview process and all that and somehow was selected to be the director of the new Vandenberg launch site at the time. So uh, me and a, a merry gang of pirates got to go build the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy launch pad up at Vandenberg. Uh, we did that over the course of about two years and for about you know $12.98, we make, made it happen wow. uh, very scrappily <laughs> and uh, got to the launch, uh, got to several launches where I, I had the opportunity to be launch director and things like that. Uh, Elon asked me to come down and run launch operations down in Hawthorne for a number of years, uh, eventually took over the mission management piece as well, uh, doing uh, all the civil, commercial, and uh, military launches, got to certify Falcon 9 for military launches, as well as for NASA launches, and eventually for human rating, which was uh, a, a great saga. And then uh, got to launch 22 friends uh, into outer space and look their families in the eye and tell them it's very important that we bring mom or dad back and that uh, you know we have a successful mission. So opportunity of a lifetime. So grateful to SpaceX and all my friends there. Then uh, met uh, this crazy stalker, uh, Sebastian Estrella, <laughs> uh, on the internet, who he has these Jedi mind tricks that he plays on people to pull them out of retirement and things like that to uh, get them to come and uh, change the course of humanity uh, for a second time. So uh, grateful that that he did that and uh, we formed Think Orbital and the sky's the limit. Fantastic. So now we're not strangers anymore. Let's get into it. Sebastian, what's been happening at Think Orbital since last year when we spoke? Well, lo lots of things happened um, since we last spoke. We were selected for and delivered on time and on budget two U.S. Space Force contracts. These are STTR Phase 1 contracts in collaboration with the likes of uh, Arizona University, MIT, KMI, and a couple of others. Also, our main piece of technology, which is our electron welding head, it's well underway. We just hit technology readiness level four, uh, which, you know, is, is quite a milestone. It's before you actually go into full, full test. And we're planning to actually run two test flights, one in December uh, this year and the one in June, which we'd love to talk to you about a little bit more. Uh, we continue to attract top talent. We have Lee Rosen as our third co-founder, absolute rock star, uh, and the same with our CTO, <laughs> Frank Tybor. And soon enough, we're going to have a third ex SpaceXer as a data integration and, uh, and, and testing director. In that sense, it's been fantastic. We've also won some competitive awards with the state of Colorado. The state of Colorado is showing us a lot of love. We have an incentive, uh, about just over half a million, uh, when it comes to uh, basically employee incentives. And we also won an industry award, non-diluted funding of about a quarter of a million. So yeah, it's, it's great to be not only welcome, but recognized in the industry. We also raised um, a couple of million. So that's helping us with regards to our runway and accelerating us to be able to get to a higher TRL or technology readiness level. Big shout out to 7%, TFX, and a few other investors as well out there that you know, have put their faith on us. And, and also last but not least, we won a significant Space Act Agreement. It's an unfunded Space Act Agreement with NASA. It's a collaboration for commercial space capabilities. It's a second time, second iteration that NASA runs this program. And effectively what it is, is um, they select companies that have promising technology that could help the low Earth orbit economy. And in our case, they actually picked up the full spectrum all the way from what we like to call our toolkit, which is our construction toolkit to be able to weld, cut, inspect, and also do added manufacturing space, all the way to the infrastructure in space itself. And and I, I love just to post it a little bit there and, and pass it over to, to Lee with regards to the first iteration of this the first program, which was run by SpaceX. And maybe if you can share a little bit more about this, please. Yeah, the uh, the first iteration was uh, in like 2014 or 2015 for the, um, it's called the CCSC2. We hate acronyms, but uh, 
collaborations for commercial space capabilities is a bit of a mouthful. And at SpaceX, it was more focused on uh, launch vehicles. So I think uh, United Launch Alliance was one of the winners. SpaceX was one of the winners. Uh, I believe Blue Origin was another one of the winners uh, to help develop new launch vehicle technology. Um, and out of that collaboration capabilities came Starship. And, you know, many of the folks that were in these collaboration type of uh, unfunded space act agreements ended up getting contracts with NASA to build launch vehicles. And I think, you know, the, the work that SpaceX is doing on the Artemis program is, is proof positive of that. And we hope the same thing happens out of the second uh, iteration of this, uh, this type of space act agreement as well. Absolutely. So you talked about the NASA partnership. Congratulations. Can you describe the process of pitching these ideas to NASA and what do you think appealed to them the, the most? So, yeah, N NASA has a, a process of uh, selection for technologies that would help deliver NASA's mission. Uh, and also in this particular case, when it comes to the development of the low Earth orbit economy, the, the kind of continuity of the U.S. in space, what happens after the International Space Station is the commission. So it's, it's kind of a variety of programs that, that NASA runs. And this, by all means, is my, you know, my humble opinion, of course. Um, I'm sure NASA has a lot more to say about this. Um, and, and what they do is they, they try to put out solicitations that help for them in a way to understand who is developing what technologies, how these technologies serve that mission that I mentioned, and then um, allow them to be able to go through a competitive process that, in a way, helps NASA understands more in depth, not only, you know, is the technology feasible? Is this the right thing to be able to deliver that technology? Will that technology be relevant to the needs of NASA and so on and so forth? And I, and I counted about just over 10 steps, kind of gates that we had to go through, uh, which involved not only preparing the solicitation, but also having, you know, a, a sort of a two hour uh, meeting with NASA explaining things. I mean, I'm very cautious of what I can share or not share, so I'll keep it very high level. Um, and then, uh, you know, a, sort of a, a final set of stages towards the end. And, you know, it's been super exciting for us. Um, we we said certainly kind of keep punching above our weight. Um, but, you know, imagine having our mission, having the dream to be able to do what we're planning to do and then having the validation. Uh, to some extent uh, of NASA saying, look, guys, you know, I, I know the challenge is hard, but, you know, should you guys be successful, this can have a significant impact across the, the whole of the low Earth orbit economy. And and the, the thing is, you know, for us, we are super convinced. You can imagine that's the reason why we're doing what we're doing. You know, we, we kind of, some of us left our jobs, some of us have fully relocated, Lee's already there. So we're putting, we're putting a lot of our lives at stake. We've only, we all invest in things for ourselves. Now, when it comes to Stumbi, who like NASA, who is a benchmark, right? When it comes to space, you know, saying some of the things that we think are true, it, it kind of gives you that, that extra boost. It gives you internal boost, but also, um, you know, like external recognition um, that we are, you know, we're clearly onto something. Super exciting for us. Yeah, especially when you look at the, the different companies that have been awarded this on this in this round. I mean, you, you're up there with the big players here, aren't you? Yeah, big time. I mean, just to be on that same list with some of those companies is an honor in and of itself. But, you know, the opportunities that this opens up to collaborate directly with NASA and to use those amazing NASA resources, everything from testing capabilities to human resources. That, I mean, just brilliant people. They have experts in electron beam welding that are doing modeling, things like that, all the way up to you know, the possibility of uh, asking for flights to the International Space Station to prove technology. So it really opens up the whole gamut of NASA's amazing capabilities. And we're just pleased as punch to be able to collaborate directly with them. Yeah. And and especially if I say in, in my case, I mean, Lee, it's, just, I would like to call it a space guy, right? He's a, he's a rock star. He's been into space all his life. I'm, although I've been on it for like two and a half years, I still feel kind of my childhood dream to be able to collaborate with NASA. Right, and this is a collaboration agreement with NASA. So, of course, for Think Orbital, this is huge, and at the personal level, for me, it's also um, you know quite quite significant to be able to have that possibility. As a child, it was my dream, right? So coming through to some extent, and uh, and then the tangible aspects that Lee was referring to. You know, we need an expert in in space welding, and we have access to it. We need access to you know a thermal, huge thermal vacuum chamber, and we can have access to. Yeah, I mean, just a very side comment. I remember my, my first entrepreneurship experience, I was seven years old and I had a lemon tree on the back of my house. So I decided to make lemonade 
and coming from those humble beginnings, you know, whereas we'd exchange lemonades for newspapers and then newspapers going to, to the paper mill and getting some cash there to be able to have the opportunity to work with the likes of Lee and, and everyone else and NASA now. It's kind of, uh, to me, it's a, it's a dream country and I'll stop there. All right. Love that. So a little follow up. Has the NASA award already opened other doors for you and has it helped, you know, raise your profile and garnered interest in other opportunities for Think Orbital? Yeah, for sure. I mean, just in having that recognition that you can play in Peoria or you can play on Broadway. And when you're playing with NASA, you're playing on Broadway. We <laughs> really like that uh, piece of it. So we've um, had opportunities to reach out to several of the other CCSC2 winners, which is is great. And, you know, we've got collaborations going with folks like uh, Sierra Space and with Blue Origin and with Axiom and with Northrop Grumman and several other uh, folks, too numerous to mention. Um, and I think the credibility that that has added to the Think Global name has been tremendous. So um, yeah, it's opened all kinds of doors, uh, both on the commercial side as well as the government side, because now NASA is obviously interested in technology. The U.S. Space Force is also interested in the technology. So it certainly has opened uh, many doors for us, and we're excited to be able to share this with, with all of these different groups. Yeah, and, and certainly, uh, if I may compliment, influx of emails and messages and perhaps just a little apology to everyone that is reaching out. It's, you know, it's crunch time, I think, but no, we are, we are super grateful of everyone that, you know, wants to be part of the journey uh, from, from all the different aspects um, that they're interested to, you know, to come and help Think Orbital uh, realize our mission. It doesn't hurt from the fundraising perspective either, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine not. Yeah. So with, within the, the NASA press release, they talked about your Think Platforms, which yes. I, I'm assuming that's the toolkit that you've you've mentioned. Have I got that right or have I, am I wrong there? Well, you're not wrong. So there, I would say there, there are two clear distinct parts. So one, it's the uh, in-space construction toolkit. And if I was to put it very simple, it's basically a tool that allows us to be able to weld in space. Right. Joins two pieces of metal. Also, it allows us to be able to cut alloy in space. And at the same time, with kind of extension and customization of the technology, we can also inspect us. So imagine if you, if you weld something, normally you want to know how good the weld is. And to be able to inspect that, normally you want to go for x-rays. So you can see with, you know, with sort of a, a, a high level of detail, the quality of that weld. And then ultimately, if you need to repair perhaps an alloy, uh, you know, a, a metal structure because it's been hit by debris, then being able to depose some metal through 3D printing, that also helps. So that, that toolkit in itself is the first pillar of that engagement uh, with NASA. And then the great thing is that that toolkit is the technology stack. So basically it's the bedrock for us to be able to go and do the thing platforms. And the thing platforms, the way we have envisioned them now, that normally, you know, a sphere, it makes a lot of sense, lowest cross-section against micrometerized, highest volume versus weight ratio, you know, the sort of the, the um, pressure distribution. But once you actually are able to uh, construct in space, you can construct various different other type of infrastructure. And that's that's the beauty of it. And, and that's why reading out on the, um, the latest uh, report from NASA, which is also the way they have done the award, um, it's why, uh, you know, Phil McAllister, the director, states clearly there that, you know, should this be successful, it could have a significant impact, as I said earlier, to the whole of the lower form economy. And we, we read with Lee, I can't remember now, was it direct or indirectly about 60% of the GDP in the US? You know, it's about joining a couple of metals together. So you can imagine, if, you know, when we can do that in space. So it, it's um, it's profound. It's, it's very interesting. You know, the toolkit itself, you know, if you think of I like to think of it as like the, the, the old gold rush of, the, of 1849, right? So if you think of the toolkit as the picks and shovels, if you will, uh, and then the frontier towns that were built as the think platforms, right? The, the impact to the new space economy is just incredible because today, uh, the way business has always been done in space, it's from this very scarce mindset, right? Very, things got to be very small. You know, we build them here on Earth. Sometimes we origami them to fit them inside the payload fairing of a rocket, which makes them more complex and more expensive and heavier and all that kind of stuff. Uh, then they go into space and, and get deployed. So you're very much constrained by the payload volume uh, capacity of the rocket, right? And what we're trying to do is break that paradigm the way we've done business for 
you know, 60 plus years in space by building on the ground, cramming it into the rocket, launching it in outer space, uh, and actually building big infrastructure where you need it in situ, right? So you got to have the tools to do that. That's the welding, that's the cutting, that's the inspection, and that's the additive manufacturing piece to be able to go build these big infrastructure things in outer space. And why do you need big infrastructure in outer space? Well, you know, when we talk to the pharmaceutical industry and they do an experiment on the International Space Station and they get like three grams of finished product back, they're ecstatic about it. And we say, well, what if you could have 20 tons of finished product back in a 4,000 cubic meter size, 20 meter diameter uh, sphere manufacturing facility on orbit? They go, wow, uh, number one, uh, we'd help a lot of people on Earth with new pharmaceuticals. And number two, we'd all be rich. So in my <laughs> mind, those are both really good outcomes, right? <laughs> How long do you think it will be until this is operational? Are, are we relying on something like Starship to be com- uh, operational? Or, or do, does something like this not need a rocket capable of, of huge payload weight? We have a detailed plan. That was also part of the submission that we had to do for NASA. And of course, as, as any other plan, as you start going deeper and deeper into the future, then you know the, the level of accuracy um, kind of diminishes, right? Uh, but we're looking at having product ready in space toolkit within 30 months, wow. give, give or take, right? And and we're, we're trying to not operate on Elon's timelines. So we're de risking <laughs> the technology we're, on that sense. We're, we're tracking and we'd love to tell you a little bit more perhaps about our flight one that is coming up in December. The idea is to be able to get to a position where, you know, we will be taking uh, more formal customer orders and to be able to deliver the first toolkit uh, within the timeline that I mentioned. We're not talking about years from now. Also, we're not talking about a bottomless pit of money being thrown at it. We, you know, we're we're working on scrappy approach, and that's where the wealth of knowledge that Lee, uh, Frank, and our new di- the director of the, uh, integration and testing brings in. Kind of that SpaceX mindset: being agile, be scrappy, get a product in the hands of of our customers as soon as possible, with the highest value uh, possible as well. Dave, we we believe that we'll be able to build that infrastructure in space within the five to seven year time frame. Uh, no question. Perhaps first as an adjunct to an existing space station, uh, one of the commercial LEO destinations to put a, quote, beam-like module, uh, like the one that's on the International Space Station from Bigelow, only way bigger and a rigid structure, obviously, for one of the commercial LEO destination uh, providers uh, to add space uh, to their uh, existing uh, offering uh, and hopefully differentiate one of them to be selected by NASA for building that international space station, and then eventually to build our own free flyer for the manufacturing, for the Space Force missions, for human habitation, those kind of things in the future. Does that mean you are reliant on something like Starship being operational? Oh. or Now, we're, we're completely rocket agnostic. As much as <laughs> nice. I love SpaceX, and we <laughs> all love SpaceX, a capability like Starship allows us to build really big infrastructure in space. Like uh, I mentioned the 4,000 cubic meter, 20 meter diameter sphere that we could build uh, with a single Starship launch, right? Um, but, you know, in the trunk of a Dragon spacecraft, we could build, um, you know, a, a, I think it's 7.7 meter diameter sphere on a single Falcon 9. We could build the same volume as the International Space Station on one launch. So, I mean, the ability, again, to build wow. in situ infrastructure is so different than, I know it, it like blows your mind how how big you can get by building it there. And we use this analogy, I think it's kind of interesting, of you wouldn't build the Empire State Building in New Jersey, put it on a truck and take it to New York City. It makes absolutely no sense. Yet that's how we've been doing it for years and years in space, right? So we want to build in situ. And by building in situ, you can build really big things as long as you have the materials and the tools to do it. And that's what we're providing. I think Emily and I's reaction, as you said that, was exactly the same. Yeah. Hang on. I was like, holy crap. That's a lot. (laughs) You can do what on a single Falcon 9 launch? That can't be right. That can't be right. It's right. It's right. I'm telling you. (laughs) We've got the calcs. Fantastic. Wow. And I think what Lisa alluded to is I think it's important, not only in terms of the risk in our operations, because we're not reliant on Starship. Um, but also when it comes to different customer applications, we can tailor, you know, the product itself to the launch vehicle of choice. Yeah. And this is an interesting point because again, the way things are done today, 
pretty much every payload for a specific rocket, right? It's got to meet the, the loads profile. It's got to meet the dimensions. It's got to meet the separation mechanisms, all, all of those kind of things. Frankly, we could just as, a, adjust the size of our parts very slightly and, and launch on any rocket. So it's, it's really makes it much simpler perhaps than, uh, the way things are done today where they're bespoke for every single rocket. Mm. All right. So a follow-up question. So what is this test launch in December? Tell us a little more about that if, if you can. Uh, sure. I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Um, so basically any space company worth their salt gets space heritage as quickly as possible, right? So what we're planning to do is have a launch that allows us to get, and I, I can't talk too much about it until it's all finalized, but uh, we're getting there very close. Uh, and basically what we're doing is we're launching uh, an experiment that has our welder on board. Uh, we've got uh, coupons for welding uh, and basically coupons are different uh, types of alloys as well as different characteristics of those alloys, like the gap between the two pieces of metal that we're going to go weld, the type of weld that we're going to do, whether it's a attack weld or a second pass weld and things like that. So basically, if you can imagine a, a turntable, right, and it has these six weld samples that uh, we're working both with the European Space Agency and with NASA on uh, to provide us those samples, and uh, they're going to do all of the analysis on this data that we get back, and it allows us to basically go weld these different articles in space and then do all of the inspection on that once we get that data back. Just a side note, and, and why it's important for us of course like lee was saying i mean we are doing test on the ground so we are that's how we the risk technology but you know clearly be able to do it in space and we think it's going to work until you do it you know you're not 100 sure mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time why it's so relevant um to some of the partners that we mentioned is because they also have models they also have let's say um you know algorithms and data to some extent that would allow them to identify how a particular activity in space could take place but until you do that activity in space and until you get that real data, until you get that feedback, the uh, level of accuracy of those models is not yet tested. And that's why it's so important to have that loop and that feedback that is coming back from our experiment, of course, and many others. All right. So you've talked a bit about, you know, some of the technologies y'all are uh, going to be using, such as, uh, I think, electron beam welding and things like that. So let's talk a little bit about debris removal. That's something else that you guys have talked about in your website. So I know Think Orbital is working on a way to sustainably uh, mitigate debris from piling up in the low Earth orbit environment, so to speak. So why is space debris such a hot topic now when, I mean, it's been piling up arguably for, for decades and decades. <laughs> so it, it is a concern. We know of maneuvers that the ISS need to make in order to you know, reduce the risk or mitigate the risk of having impact. And that is a growing concern, right? As we have swarms of satellites and, you know, sort of higher uh, cadence on launch. So at which point it becomes critical that could limit, you know, humanity's access to low Earth orbit for sure and beyond. And whilst there isn't yet a clear customer who, you know, who's going to foot the bill, right? Who's going to pay for this? But we believe it's important from a sustainability perspective to think about ways to be able to anticipate how we're going to be dealing with this. And, and you know, there are many ways, uh, many of our partners are looking into one of the ways that we feel, and, and this is one of the studies that we did for the US Space Force collaboration with the, the startup, great bunch of guys, engineers called KMI and uh, in collaboration with MIT. I think if I was to do it simplified in, in, in my head is instead of doing one mission per the orbit in one piece of debris or let's say a, a, an upper stage, uh, then why not deal with all of this having tags, having, you know, orbital transfer vehicles or, or something that could actually capture that debris, bring it into a hub, like for example, a thin, thin platform. And there either you deorbit in a controlled manner, all of that debris in one go, uh, which even that proved to be a lot more economical um, and certainly safer, or being able to use some of that debris. And I, I hate to call it junk um, because to me, most of this could also be used as a resource, right? Um, and use some of that that resource either to be able to convert it into fuel propellants or to be able to convert it into wire feed. And for example, one of the applications of our toolkit that we've been talking in space construction toolkit requires 
a wire to be able to do metal deposition, to do, be able to do 3D printing. So try and think about it in a smart way where it becomes more cost effective. Um, so whoever's going to foot bill, either government or a doubt the private entity, becomes a lot more affordable. Do it in a way that you can actually scale. So you, you don't do one mission every five years, but do it in a way that you can actually deal with a lot of the debris in, in one go. And then do it in a way that is also sustainable, where um, you know you can maybe reutilize some of those assets. But, and th that's kind of the vision that we had in terms of an overall ecosystem in a space when it comes to debris. But I'm not sure if, Lee, if there's anything else that I may have missed. No, I think the hub and spoke kind of delivery model is the way to go um, versus the traditional concept of operation where it's very energy inefficient, right? You take that piece of debris from probably a higher orbit down to some lower orbit so that you get a much more rapid decay of that debris and perhaps an uncontrolled deorbit uh, to have a centralized location or a hub where you would deposit that debris, aggregate it, reuse it, perhaps as Sebastian mentioned, or just deorbit the entire sphere of debris once you collect uh, the entire volumes worth. And according to the study with MIT, they said that saves about 60% of the cost of debris removal compared to that traditional concept of operations that's energy inefficient. So we think there's something there. I, I look at debris remediation like I look at global warming and the environmental problems that we're seeing today, right? It has become a global problem. And there are countries on earth that are starting to do something about that, but we have to do something collectively as humanity. And I hope we tackle the debris remediation problem much faster than we've tackled the environmental problems that we're all facing today. I love the idea of repurposing things that are already in space. In space. I love that idea. Next door in a unit next door, there's a guy who repurposes everything. Uh, he'll find <laughs> anything from anywhere and find a use for it. It's amazing. Andrew Park, he's absolutely amazing at this. I think he'd love to get in space and have a go at this as well. Um, so <laughs> I, I just... Porters in space. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> right. He'd turn it into a space lamp orders. or something like that. Some kind of lamp in space. Amazing. There you go. Uh, or a bench. A bench for us to go and sit on in space. Well, we'll turn anything into anything. I love that idea. It's going gonna, it's gonna to save people a lot of money, this, isn't it? That's the whole point, right? That actually that, that there's a real purpose to all these things that you're, you're building. It's not just building for the sake of building. Absolutely. That's the mindset since the beginning. So we're, we're a commercial entity. We are looking at you know, generating commercial revenue and become profitable, uh, but at the same time to be able to give something back. And uh, whilst you know, active digital remediation in itself, perhaps it's an avenue that may not become profitable uh, unless you have massive support from government. It's something that we believe it must be done. And, and then when you start looking at other applications as an outcome of being able to repurpose um, some of the debris, it also means that you start thinking about re reutilization of resource in situ, right? And we're talking about you know orbits around Earth, but when you start talking about the moon and then far beyond the moon, where, you know, especially the earlier missions, uh, where it may take weeks to months to maybe years for the next resupply mission to come, to come on and, and help you with perhaps broken trust, right? Imagine if you have a broken trust or broken piece of, of, of infrastructure and you cannot complete your canopy or whatever it may be that you're building, right? To be able to re reutilize the resources that you have, and I know we all agreeing, but to reutilize the resources you have uh, in situ and to be able to repurpose them in a way that not only you utilize them, but to be able to build a piece of material that you need to be able to complete your mission. Those things are, I would say they're critical, right? And that's where, we, that's where we come in. And even for example, I know perhaps it doesn't get a lot of uh, rapport, but be able to cut in space and the technology that we're developing to be able to cut in space where it's debris free. So you don't create other type of debris. It's trust free. So basically you're not going to be moving yourselves or the other assets when you're cutting things through. Um, and at the same time, also because of the uh, of the concentration of heat and the speed on, in which we actually do the cutting process, heat in itself is it's quite manageable. So you don't creating a lot of heat, which has different in, you know interesting applications. Um, so yeah, we, we're thinking about it from all perspectives. And if I could add, just on on, on the one thing on the toolkit that, that we don't talk a lot a lot, but uh, from my military background, I think it's really really cool, right? is the inspection capability. So mm. one of the things that this uh, multi-tool uh, weatherman type of electron beam thing gets you, not only can you weld with it, but you can cut with it, as 
Sebastian just mentioned, but you can also um, detune the gun and fire it at a piece of metal and much like an x-ray machine, which is basically an electron beam gun that fires so punks then generate your own x-ray source to do inspection, right? And, you know, not only just inspection of the weld, when we plan this, right, which we will, uh, with a robotic arm and using this electron beam x-ray generator uh, as an end effector um, with detector kind of on the front side and the arm on this side and a satellite in between, the ability to look into the guts of a satellite and see what's there, what it's doing, kind of blows my mind. Like every shipping container at the port of Los Angeles, they don't go in, in and do an inventory. They basically run it through a big x-ray machine to see what's inside. I think we're able to be able to do something very, very similar and create a 3D model of what's actually inside a satellite. Not only to understand kind of the capabilities, perhaps, of the adversary satellites, but uh, even if you had something like the very unfortunate event with the Viasat satellite that's up there now that can't deploy its antenna, if you could take an X-ray of that deployment mechanism to help with troubleshooting that antenna and perhaps give them a clue on how to fix it, I mean, you could have a tremendous impact. And what we hope to do is to be able to package this toolkit into a robotic arm end defector sell it for a very reasonable price and easily integratable onto the multitude of different space tugs and servicing missions and refueling missions that are coming along. And you kind of turn those space tugs from one trick ponies into kind of a multi-tool kit, right? So you can actually do true satellite servicing wow. and inspection. And we think that's a really, really exciting future to be able to promulgate this capability uh, throughout and and get that data back to the folks that might need it. Yeah. And look, let's put ourselves in four years down the line, right? I mean, and the the uh, the, the toolkit is operational. Uh, it's up in space doing its business. And if we take the ca the unfortunate case of Biasat, in itself, and and I'm kind of playing from memory, it cost um, around four hundred million. I think the whole mission, roughly, give or take if they were to declare it a total loss. So Im imagine a situation where we have the capability that Lee was mentioning, you know, we could be able to uh, do a scan uh, and and be able to identify what the issue is. And imagine we have the capability to be able to repair in situ that issue. Now, that means that mission in itself could potentially be rescued, could be salvaged, Crazy. could be operational. Uh, but also beyond that, when you, when you start looking at not just the the mission itself and the customers that are waiting for it. But imagine the impact on the companies, how they de-risk this type of operations. Like as, as far as I remember, Biasat market cap lost about $2 billion. I mean, they, they lost, I don't know, it was 20% or, you know what I mean? So when you start putting all of this to, I know I'm kind of going a little bit more on the, on the outskirts of all of this, but when you start putting a capability like, like this, that can do so much for so many different companies in space, once they start realizing of this, that's why I think that statement, and again, I, I don't want to paraphrase, but that, that statement from NASA says it's, it could be significant to the whole Earth orbit economy. Absolutely. Is there, you've kind of uh, answered this a little bit, but um, you've talked about all the different organizations you've all are working with and, and have worked with. So do you guys have a bucket list on the wall of the office of, of companies or organizations you'd like to work with? Or, or are you already uh, collaborating with all of them? I, I feel humbled and lucky that we are collaborating with everybody that we would like to collaborate. I'm sure there's a lot of other companies out there that we haven't yet met. Um, but um, I think in a way, thanks to, you know, Lee and, and, and some of the folks we have in the team, also advisors, you know, who are, again, I keep saying the word rock stars and well-connected. They have, you know, a huge trajectory. And also thanks to the Think Orbital team to be able to, you know, stand on our own feet and show that we mean business. We, we have been able to talk to, and I'm not sure how much I can share because of non-disclosure agreements, but we've been, we've been able to talk to, um, you know, um, significant companies, big legacy companies, new companies, uh, and we are in the midst of basically defining the level of collaboration, uh, be it actually working together on a submission for a new government contract or pairing up together with regards to proposing to another commercial entity on how we can do things differently, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I'm just cautious a little bit what we can share, but I mean, from our perspective, I think it's, um, yeah, and not just other commercial entities, but also when it comes to government, both civilian and defense, 
yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's been wonderful so far. Yes. And, and the cool thing is the tide is kind of turning too, Emily, you know, that, uh, it's not us having to go and pester people anymore. They're reaching out to us, which is very, very cool. So as the name gets out there, as the capabilities get out there, the interest continues to rise, which is so cool. Are you concerned in any way that your name may missell you? Because if your toolkit is available and could be used on deep state, deep space missions, then surely Think Orbital isn't thinking big enough. Are you thinking <laughs> big enough? That's what I want to know. <laughs> oh, that yeah, it's something that comes to mind and it came to mind even uh, even yesterday. Thinking, okay, Think Orbital because we thought about you know orbit, cis lunar, and uh, and beyond. But yeah, when you start talking about um, some government entities that are that looking at advanced logistics and, you know, what can you do, what can you guys do for me on Mars? Maybe at some point we may need to adapt the name, but we, we love it. We love it. <laughs> Good. Hey, Mars is in orbit around the sun too, right? So Absolutely. everything's True. in orbit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Things in orbit. <laughs> yeah. Good, good point. Exactly. Good point. Exactly. Thank you so much for joining us once again. This has been amazing. This has been so amazing. This is one of those chats where I've just been smiling all the way through and my mind is racing at all the different possibilities of what this means. And uh, I just think it's amazing what you're doing. I'm so glad you got this award as well. It, it, it's great to see uh, your company and how you've developed and how you're continuing to develop and how you're growing. And uh, it's just so fun to watch for, from, the, from the viewpoint that Emily and I have. It's just so much fun. So thanks for coming and talk to us again about it. And, and can we do this again next yes. year and have another Thank update? You. Is that all oh, right? Oh, yes. So, yeah, of course. Yeah, And, and you, you yeah. guys get the invitation for the launch. Oh, amazing. Once we have a launch date, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank yes. you. Thank you. That was awesome. I'm still holding you to your promise that we, we'll get to go to the space station when you build that. So. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yes, we have already a list, <laughs> list of people who have been supporters since you know, since the outset, like yourself. So it's a pleasure to catch wow. up and, and, and uh, yeah, be able to talk to you again. Absolutely. Well, I look forward to it, both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Your membership powers our podcast please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, let me give you a little insight on what I wrote down in, in that. The whole thing blew my mind. But yes, what, what it dawned on me, we're talking about future tech, and all I could think of was we're currently in the 50th anniversary of Skylab. Yes. And imagine if this technology was around 50 years ago. Skylab would have been fixed so quickly. Imagine being oh, able yeah. to X-ray what was gone on and and not rely yeah. on a spy satellite coming over and taking some photos and having to get permission to get a spy set to do that. You know, yeah, absolutely. But also, I was thinking, how many more Skylabs there could be if they go around and find all the old rocket pieces that are left and turn them into new space stations, the whole repurposing thing, exactly. debris and stuff like that. I was suddenly thinking, oh my God, we're going to have a whole raft of Skylabs in the next 20 years orbiting uh, the planet again. How much yeah. fun is this? This is amazing. This is such that would be an awesome. exciting thing that they are doing. I just love this. I absolutely love that interview. It's one of my favorites we've done. Yeah. Yeah, I really, really did enjoy it. What are your thoughts? It's really cool. Um, uh, obviously, the the technology for me is just mind blowing. Everybody knows I'm a big fan of the High Frontier by Gerard K. O'Neill, and I feel like this is really what he was talking about in the book because yeah. he was talking more about okay, we need to actually make infrastructure, we need to build infrastructure in space to really get a sense of what it's like to to go out there. You know, we the model of just sending stuff up, sending stuff up, up and down, up and down, up and down. You know, that's nice. But it's not going to be sustainable for a long period of time, you know, like decades. Another thing I thought was really cool, and this is less technology and more just like it has been so cool to follow Think Orbital's journey through doing this podcast because uh, we interviewed them a, a while back and now they've just grown. They've got this um, space act agreement with with NASA and they're working with a lot of companies, some of them for understandable reasons they couldn't name during the interview, which I totally understand. And a lot, you know, their ideas are actually, I think, pretty practical. Like I've followed some space companies for the last decade or so. And some of the stuff is like castles in the sky type stuff. And I'm like, how, mm. are, how are they going to do this? You know, I mean, it sounds cool, but I'm like, I need to see it happen. But a lot of the technology that Think Orbital is discussing, like that, for example, the electron beam whelming. Uh, well, oh, my God, I screwed that up. 
electron beam welding. There we go. There we go. I got it. <laughs> that's something I believe that's been demonstrated to work in space before. I, I think the Soviets did it at one point. If I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. But to my knowledge, they actually did try it and it worked. This isn't just something hypothetical like, oh, yeah, and we're going to invent magic and it's just going to come together. And it's like, what? You know, like these are things that are actually quite practical and that are able to be done. And I, and also the idea of being able to, you know, X-ray or image, you know, a satellite in orbit, find exactly what's wrong with it and be able, hopefully, to service it. You know, they brought up the Viasat situation recently. It sucks. I mean, Viasat lost money over that. And not, it's not just that they lost money, but the, I think they sent up a broadband satellite. And that's a real, also, that's a letdown to customers who need broadband. Yeah. So, you know, when you have a satellite issue or a failure it affects not just the company but it it does affect customers because customers just aren't able to access certain things that the satellite promised to have a capability to actually service these kinds of satellites on orbit figure out what's wrong with them these are things that i i view as actually practical that we should be doing that we should have been doing in space years ago but we just haven't yet and i think now we're beginning to fulfill that promise so this was fascinating. I can't wait to follow him further. I hope we have him on our show in the future because I'd like to, I want to keep following their story until, uh, until forever, hopefully uh, until I'm, I'm off of this earth. Yeah. <laughs> what, what struck me was that they're talking about things which we take for granted on earth, which, which don't happen yeah. in space, like cutting and welding things that happen every day, but um, in every country, these things happen all the time around yeah. the world. It's really simple stuff that isn't simple in space and yet no. they're about to do, if they can get it right it changes everything it, it it's, yeah. really does change everything what I also like is this idea we Emily you and I spend a lot of time on this podcast looking backwards right we we like looking yeah. backwards we, we, are, we, we love what's happened in the past we celebrate it and, and every now and then we get to look forward but we look forward through the eyes of people who are looking forward right because we don't have yeah. The brains necessarily are the we are we're not wired to think of what might the world look like in twenty five years and how do we get there? Yeah. And that's what these people are doing. That's what people exactly, like yeah. Lee and Seb are doing Sebastian are doing. And to talk to people like that is just so inspiring because I'm not well, I'm not wired that way to to be able to think, right, in twenty five years time I want to see this, 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 this. Yeah. And, you know, someone like Gerard K. Neal writes that book and, and says, well, I want to see yeah. a space station that has this cap capability and this, that, and the other. And I don't have that kind of mind. When I read that book, I was like, oh, like my brain yeah. exploded, you know? Absolutely. Exactly. And, and, and now not only are we seeing people that have got the capability to, to really think and, and picture those things, but also to make them happen. Yeah. And, and, and figure out how to do that in a corporate world. And and to put, execute it, put that the all idea. together, and to absolutely execute the idea and make that plan, and that is what I find so super inspiring and exciting about these kind of interviews, uh, and and following a company like Think Orbital. I'm wearing the t-shirt right now, and I'm proud to wear that t-shirt, and I love. It's really comfy as well. I, I, I'm not sure if they sell them on their website. I'll look it up, and if they do, then then yeah, go and get I one. I need to buy another one. I need to buy another one. So of course you can see that full unedited episode over on our Patreon page, and is that your question? We're going to start doing this. There was one question which you can only see if you're on Patreon, and I will post uh, that video of just that question in our Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash space and things. And if you want to keep up to date with everything that's going on with Think Orbital, in the show notes, I will put links to all their social media and their website. So check that out at spaceandthingspodcast.com. Are you over the moon about this podcast? It's not just a phase. You're listening to Space and Things. So, Emily, what's caught your eye in spaceflight since last week? I'm going to keep it very brief. Um, I did want to uh, send uh, deepest condolences to the friends and family of Ozzy Osband, who is the originator mm -hmm. of the 321 telephone area code. As you know, uh, that is Brevard County's area code. And he was a self-described rocket hobo. Uh, he was a uh, volunteer, I believe, at the uh, U.S. Space and Missile Museum in uh, Cape Canaveral, and he, he dedicated his time to volunteering for a lot of different uh, space museums and space causes down there. He routinely led launches at Spaceview Park as well. Uh, I, I met him several times. 
He was 72, and he will be hugely missed. The guy was a legend in the Space Coast, and I just wanted to give a big shout out to him. Uh, he will be missed terribly, and and once again, we send our deepest condolences. Yeah, very sad news. Yep, he was a he was a legend. And, and better news, I just saw this article actually this week. Uh, the Juno spacecraft, which is still orbiting Jupiter in a highly elliptical Jovian orbit, has imaged the uh, moon. Io, 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 Io. <laughs> the, Io, Io, uh, you? Io, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I- I've heard it said both ways, so I'll just say Io. But it has imaged the Jupiter uh, Jovian moon, Io, and the images are incredible. It has uncovered a lot of uh, volcanic, a lot more volcanic activity on that moon. Uh, famously, nice. there was volcanism discovered on that moon uh, during the Voyager encounter. Jupiter's Voyager encounter 1979. I, I believe it was uh, Linda Morabito, who was working at JPL at the time, looked on a looked on her TV screen and saw, "Hey, there's a plume coming out of there's a plume coming out of there," you know, which is wild. They never, I mean, that was like a new discovery. So now they're kind of discovering the extent of the volcanism on Io and the pictures. If you look at nothing just but the pictures and don't read the articles. It's really incredible to look at. The article that I looked at was an article by Mashable uh, discussing the the sort of uh, encounter that Juno had with Io, and the pictures are amazing. It's just really fascinating to look at. It's a it's a little known world, and we're still discovering more about it uh, since our first encounters with it, it during the 1970s. So I just thought that was really cool. So Dave, what have you been looking at this week? That is really cool. And it, nice you mentioned Voyager because Voyager 2 is back in contact after our story yes. last week. It looks like uh, we're back up up in communication with Voyager 2, which is great news. We mentioned last week about this, the Falcon Heavy launch at Kennedy Space Center. Well, here's an interesting one. As a result of that launch, uh, it's delayed the Crew 7 launch back to the end of August by a couple of weeks because of damage to the pad, which is really wow. interesting. They're having to just fix up the pad uh, at 39A. I think, yeah, 13, launch complex 39A as a result of that launch. And I just wonder what the repercussions of that are um, going going forward, whether NASA has a quiet word and says... Um, we, we kind of need to not have these delays up to the ISS. Maybe there needs to be a couple more pads of, or SpaceX needs to take a couple of, with the, the volume of flights that SpaceX now has out of Cape Canaveral. Yeah. I think they operate out of two or three launch pads. Maybe they maybe they need to to, to think about that because particularly with the, the crewed stuff going up because it also affects the return flights of yep. the crew that are currently up there uh, and some of those cargo missions. We don't want to see them getting delayed too much but for things that yeah. could be, could have been launched elsewhere if they had the capability, which I'm not sure yeah. they do at them at this point. So yeah. maybe there's conversations going on behind the scenes about about launch capability. If you're going to have all these launches happen, and what's what's the priority? It's paying customers, right? Yeah, and w- of which NASA is just one. Yeah, I know they have a pad at Vandenberg, but that's for polar launches, and those are usually yeah. Department of Defense and not like crewed you know, launches or anything like that, unless they start doing polar orbit crew launches, which I, I don't know if that'll ever happen. That'd be cool, but I, it's never happened before. But yeah, that, that brings up a good point. You know, how many, maybe they need another launch pad or maybe, you know, maybe they need a, just a dedicated Falcon heavy launch pad. Does that make sense? You know, it does, like, but I'm not sure how much yeah. longer they plan on having, using exactly. Falcon Heavy, especially if Starship. So so uh, for them, yep. they may say, well, we, we don't want to, but certainly if Falcon 9 is going to continue to fly as frequently as well, they, they need to have quick turnaround of this. And I know yep. that the whole idea of Starship is it takes care of this, but sometimes Starship will be too big for what, that we're trying to deliver and you don't need to this anyway there's a big this is a big old rabbit hole that we could fall down here but i just think it's yeah. interesting that that's that's happened and it does open a lot of questions we also on on mars the 33rd flight of, of ingenuity after three wow. months uh, of, of inaction there which is it's great to see that's back in action uh, uh which brings me up my, what i really wanted to talk about and that's the fact that lego have released and it's now on sale uh, a version of perseverance and ingenuity which you can buy and I just placed my order. Order in the UK, it's about eighty pounds. I think it's about a hundred dollars from the US store. Yeah. As a big Lego person, I like the idea of having a little Lego Technic uh, perseverance and ingenuity floating around in uh, in my little studio space here. I'm looking forward to playing with that. 
that's cute. I like the idea of having a little Lego Mars helicopter because I, I think ingenuity is just adorable. I love it. It's uh, just yeah. it's cute. It's also demonstrating very important technology, but it's it's adorable. It's it's a little helicopter. It's it's little. It's like a <laughs> itty bitty drone. It's cute, yeah, and it's just it's I love the. I, yeah, I wanted in my house. I, I would let him stay in my house. Yeah, me too. So that's what caught my eye this week. As always, there'll be links in the show notes to all the things we have discussed in the last five minutes. So uh, check them out at spaceandthingspodcast.com or just click the link in your podcast provider. Space history is never a trivial pursuit when you're listening to the Space and Things podcast. Okay, that's us finished for this episode. We hope you enjoyed it. Thanks to all who continue to share the podcast. It's lovely to see a little bump in our numbers last week due to your response to our call to share it with your friends. It really makes a huge difference, as does leaving a review or rating if your podcast platform allows. Please check to see if you can leave a rating or a review, both of which really do help. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and thank you to everybody who's helped. Uh, also, congratulations to Charles Kersey, who won our August Patreon book prize draw. To be a part of that and help us out, please consider joining our Patreon page. We're 47 people away from our goal of hitting 100 Patreons by show 200. Um, so I'm, I need to plug the heck out of this. Uh, please head over to patreon.com slash space and things. And don't forget, in space, no one can hear you me. This has been the Space and Things Podcast with Emily Carney and Dave Giles.